Hello, welcome to NAMI Virginia Advocacy 101. My name is Kathy Harkey. I'm Executive Director of NAMI Virginia. So let's go ahead and get started. So advocacy is about creating change. The goals for today's training are to understand how the Virginia General Assembly works, to understand the basics of the Virginia state budget, to understand how to tell our stories so that we're effective advocates for change. The Virginia state government is structured like the US government with three co-equal branches, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Uh, Virginia's state legislator is the oldest in the country. It was established in 1619 as the House of Burgess. Two houses, the House of Delegates and the State Senate, are within the Virginia General Assembly legislative branch. They are responsible for passing all state laws and for approving the state government budget. The House of Delegates and the Senate, State Senate meet each year beginning on the second Wednesday in January. There's a long session which meets for 60 days during even years, and that's when the two-year state budget is developed. Then the short session meets for 45 days during the odd years, and that's when the budget is amended. The Senate of Virginia is also called the Upper House and consists of 40 members. Each member represents an average of about 200,000 residents. Virginia senators serve four-year terms and they're elected during the odd years. Currently, now during 2020, the Virginia Senate is presided over by the Lieutenant Governor who is currently Justin Fairfax. As a result of the state legislative elections on November 5, 2019, Democrats gained control of both the Virginia State Senate and the Virginia House of Delegates. The Senate has, seven, has 11 standing committees. These committees are where all the action happens. So Senate standing committees consist of agriculture, conservation and natural resources, commerce and labor, courts of justice, education and health, finance, general laws and technology, local government, privileges and elections, rehabilitation and social services, rules and transportation. Now, as we advocate, for mental health, you'll generally find us in committee sessions held by the courts of justice, education and health, finance, and rehabilitation and social services. The House of Delegates in Virginia, also called the lower house, has 100 members. Each member represents an average of about 80,000 residents in his or her district. They serve two-year terms and they're elected in odd number years. Republicans held control of the Virginia House of Delegates from 1999 until 2019. The Speaker of the House is the presiding officer. Currently, Eileen feller Corn. She's been presiding officer since January 8, 2020. The presiding officer presides over House sessions, assigns bills to committees, appoints members, and chairs 14 subcommittees. The House of Delegates Standing Committees consist of Agriculture, Chesapeake and Natural Resources, Appropriations, Commerce and Labor, Counties, Cities and Towns, Courts of Justice, Education, Finance, general laws, health, welfare, and institutions, militia, police, and public safety, privileges and elections, rules, 
science and technology, and transportation. And with the House, mental health advocates can generally be found in committee sessions through appropriations, courts of justice, health, welfare, and institutions, militia, police, and public safety. So let's talk a little bit about the Virginia legislative process. Bills may originate with a member of either house, the House of Delegates or the State Senate. And that person, whether they be in the House or the Senate, becomes the chief patron. The chief patron consults with the staff attorney who researches the existing law and determines the constitutionality of the bill. The bill is then drafted and then the chief patron submits it to the speaker of the house or the clerk of the Senate. The bill is then printed and the speaker or the clerk assigns it to the appropriate committee. Chief patrons, patrons and advocates can also request co-patrons or other members of the House or Senate who will sign on to support the bill. The House starts a bill with the letters HB, for example, HB 2500, and Senate bills start with SB, for example, SB 2500. Committees then study, debate, and vote on bills during public session. After the debate and the voting, the committee reports back to the House or the Senate with its results. Results may be that the bill was approved without amendment. The bill might have been rejected where it just dies in committee. The bill may be passed by indefinitely or sometimes termed late on the table. Tabling or carrying over to the next term can also be the result of a bill. After being read during full open session on three different days, which is called the first, second, and third reading, the full membership votes on the bill after that third reading. Past bills from each house, whether it be the House of Delegates or the State Senate, then cross over to the other house for the process of consideration after passage or at the midpoint of the session. This is called crossover. If a bill is passed by both houses, but differences exist, a conference committee will meet to resolve those differences. Once approved by both houses, the bill is then sent to the governor of Virginia for signature. At this point, the Virginia governor can sign the bill into law. The governor may amend the bill and return it to the General Assembly for approval. The governor can veto the bill and return it to the General Assembly, which can override the veto by two thirds vote of each house. Or the governor may take no action at all and the bill becomes law without the governor's signature, except for the state budget bill. The governor's signature is required on the budget. After the governor signs session bills, they are bound together and called the acts of assembly for that session. Here's a chart laying out the process that we've just discussed. Uh, you'll see on the left that a bill introduced by in the Senate is introduced by a senator. Uh, on the right, a bill introduced in the House is introduced by a delegate. In both the House or the Senate, the next step is the bill is referred to a committee. Next, either House, the committee holds a public meeting, then committee action is taken. Then there's a first reading of the bill. Then there's a second reading. This is where the bill may be amended. Next comes the third reading. And this is where the bill may be de uh, debated and a passage vote may be taken. After that, the bill crosses over. If it's in the Senate, it crosses over to the House of Delegates. 
If it's in the House of Delegates, it crosses over to the Senate. If each house insists on its own form of a bill, a committee conference is usually created. A compromise report from the committee is sent to each house for approval. Next, the bill goes to the governor. Let me get back on track with my slides here. I pushed the wrong button. There we go. So next, the bill goes to the governor and again, the governor may sign the bill into law with no action. If no action is taken within seven days, the bill actually does become law. The governor may amend and return the amended bill to both houses. The governor may veto the bill. Now, the Virginia General Assembly website is very, very easy to use. And so if you ever want to track a bill, there is a legislative information system. And here is that, here is that uh, website address. This is an excellent source for all information that you might need about bills or committees. You can search uh, for bills in a few different ways. You can search by the bill number. And again, remember, if it's a House bill, you will need to put HB in front of the number. If it's a Senate bill, you'll need to put SB in front of the number. You can also search by patron or by subject. By search, when you search for the bill, a good amount of information is going to come up. You can find out the dates and times of committee hearings to discuss that bill. Each bill is scheduled for at least one committee hearing in the committee that's responsible for the issue or the subject of the bill. Some bills go to a subcommittee and mu must pass there before being debated in a full committee. Another option that you have to get information on legislation is to call the Virginia General Assembly's constituent viewpoint com comment line, which is toll free at 1-800-889-0229. So let's talk a little bit about how the Virginia state budget works. The state budget funds all operations of state government. And we, as mental health advocates, are very concerned with mental health funding. Commonwealth has a biennial budget adopted every two years in even number years, even numbered years, with amendments made in odd numbered years. State government resources, revenue, include taxes, grants, fees, sales, earnings, transfers, and balances. The state has a couple of different funds. The general funds, which is a discretionary fund uh, where money there is used for a variety of governmental purpose purposes. Then there are non-general funds. These funds are designated for a specific purpose by law or by policy. Next, the, when the state budget is developed, agent budget, budget prepara agency budget preparation is required. State budget development is done. Legislative action is needed. And then the governor reviews the budget before the budget finally receives approval. So agent budget, agency budget preparation is when state agencies, like in the case of mental health, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, review strategic needs and submit requests to the Department of Planning and Budget by the early fall. State budget development begins later in the fall and that's where the Department of Planning and Budget reviews all agency requests to confirm and verify their needs and identify policy issues for the governor's con consideration. The Virginia governor and cabinet sec secretaries then work together to prepare a proposed budget, 
which reflects the administration's priorities. The Virginia governor then submits the proposed budget to the General Assembly on or before December 20th in the form of a budget bill. The budget bill, again, the House one is going to begin with HB and the Senate will begin with SB. They were HB 5005 and SB 5015, specifically during the 2020 special session. The budget bill is then referred to the House Appropriations Committee and the Senate Finance Committee for consideration. These committees hold public hearings and discussions and may introduce amendments to the budget bill. The amended budget bill is brought to the floor of each house where other amendments can be made. Each house then votes on the amended budget bill. After each house votes on its version of the bu budget bill, the bill crosses over to the other house where it is again debated and voted on. Before the General Assembly adjourns, a joint conference committee meets to resolve any differences between the House and the Senate. The governor then reviews the bill passed by the General Assembly. At this point, he may sign the budget bill, he may veto the entire bill or certain line items, or he may recommend amendments. If the governor vetoes the whole bill, or part of it, the bill goes back to the General Assembly during a reconvened session in the spring. If the governor recommends amendments, the bill is returned to the reconvened session for General Assembly consideration and action. But the governor must sign the Virginia budget bill. It's the only one that requires the governor's signature. The final budget with the General Assembly and Governor of Virginia amendments is passed by the General Assembly and enacted into law. The budget goes into effect on July 1st in even numbered years and on the date of passage in odd number years and state agencies have funds available on those dates. So here's a chart or a graph laying out the process of budget development. You'll see agent budget preparation generally begins in August and September. Issues um, and instructions are provided to different agencies. Then those agencies in September generate and submit their request. Review and recommendation, that process starts in November. The governor uh, takes a look and the cabinet reviews and then in December, the governor submits his budget document and bill to the General Assembly. In January, this is where the budget is deliberated on. January is when the budget bills are referred to the money committees, either appropriations or finance, depending on the House. In February, the House and the Senate produce separate budget proposals. And then in March, the conference committee reports budget bills and, general, and the General Assembly approves the budget. The governor reviews it in April and either signs, vetoes, or returns items to the General Assembly with amendments. So where does the money come from? We talked a minute ago about Virginia's revenue, uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, more exacting numbers and the actual funds. We mentioned that the general funds are discretionary funds used for a variety of governmental purposes. Non-general funds are funds designated for a specific purpose by law or policy. So you'll see non-general funds are the majority of what we use in Virginia, 63.9%. Uh, of Virginia funds are designated for a specific purpose. General funds, sometimes called rainy day funds, uh, can be used for a variety of reasons and that stands currently at 
the total annual revenue in Virginia for 2018 through 2020 was 1.18 billion. Mentioned earlier where our revenue comes from, uh, but where does it go? Does it go into general or non-general funds? So sales tax and other taxes go into the general funds. Individual and corporate tax, which make up about 75% of Virginia's revenue and budget, go into general funds. Non-general funds consist of federal grants around 39%. Transportation, about 8.5%, institutional revenue, 26.5%, and other. That might be donations, contributions uh, for a variety of reasons, and that's around 26%. So all expenditures uh, out of the general funds, 40.2% goes towards education, and about 31.6% goes towards health and human resources. Out of non-general funds, about 30.1% covers education, and 29.8% goes towards health and human resources. Mental health services and Medicaid are part of health and human resources. So how do you become an effective advocate? And what exactly is advocacy? Well, advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or a proposal. So first off, you have to know who your legislator is. And as I mentioned earlier, the Virginia General Assembly system provides outstanding resources. And another one that you can go to is who's, the, who's, who's My Legislator Service. You can find that web address here. What you're going to do is enter your full address and you're going to find out who your state delegate is, who your state senator is, and who your congressional representatives are in Washington, DC. All legislators have their own websites and they have a presence on social media, whether that be Facebook, Twitter, or another social media outlet, or all of those. So if you're on social media, it's a good idea to follow your legislators so that you can remain updated on the work they're doing. Also, attend public hearings, town hall meetings, mental health advocacy day, and of course, vote. This year in 2020, NAMI Virginia has added the 2021 Legislative Advocacy Kickoff Session to our agenda. So we hope you'll join us for that session on November 14th. So to advocate your position, you basically need to make a phone call, you need to send an email or a letter about a legislative issue or a bill. This needs to be done during the General Assembly session. Well, actually, I'm sorry, it needs to be done before the General Assembly session. Although during the session, you also need to do it. However, your email may not be quite as effective because legislators are extremely busy during the session. Uh, schedule an in-person meeting with your legislator. They love to hear from constituents. Attend committee meetings at the General Assembly. You can also write a letter to your editor. And NAMI Virginia has resources to help you, resources and templates to help you with this. Organize or attend a rally or advocacy day. NAMI Virginia generally holds advocacy day every year in January. Occasionally, it'll be held in early February, but we try to keep it somewhere towards the end of January. So please join us. Your voice matters. You deserve to be heard. Tell your story. It's an effective way to advocate. But keep these guidelines in mind. You need to have a point. You need to keep it short. 
Again, legislators are very busy. They have limited time and a lot of people who want their attention. Tie your story into a solution or your position. For example, I was helped by peer support services. So that's why I'm asking you to support increasing access to these services. So what you want to do when you tell your story is you want to be positive and friendly. You want to be brief and concise and limit the number of issues that you're discussing. I try to keep the number that I discuss to no more than two. Use fact sheets if you need to and leave one behind. Now I will say you're leaving that fact sheet behind so it's important Although it's important to include one or two facts, your story is going to be the thing, the item, the knowledge, the information that moves that legislator's heart and mind. So your story needs to be first and foremost. That fact sheet will be left behind for the legislator to look at later. Make sure you give reliable information. If you don't know an answer, say you don't know, but let, let the legislator know that's a good question and that you will research it and get back to them as quickly as possible. Be clear about your position. Say, I support this because, or I suppose oppose this because. Always thank a legislator for their time. Wait until you're in your car. If you want to complain or mumble, don't ever do that in front of a legislator. Write a thank you letter when you get home. Again, it's respectful, but it's also another way to have your name and your issue, mental health, in front of that legislator. What you don't want to do is be com confrontational, berate, or yell. The legislator may not always agree with you, and that can be frustrating, but you need, to, can, you need to keep that frustration to yourself, keep a smile on your face, and let the legislator know that you respect him or her. Never threaten. Never get off the subject or ramble on and on and on, which sometimes is easy to do because these decisions that the legislators are making affect our real lives. And it can be frustrating when we aren't accomplishing our goals, things that we know need to be done so that we can have the help and support that we need in our everyday lives. But you do not want to ramble on and on. And sometimes your emotions will rule. And when that happens, you need to just take a deep breath, stop talking for a moment, and then resume. Because when your emotions overwhelm. You sometimes don't know how to, you may not know how to close. And so it's better to just take that deep breath and, and get control of your emotions and then can continue on with your point. Don't ever say, this was a waste of my time. And never, ever blow off a legislative aid. They are so extremely important. And if you make an appointment with a legislator, there's a good chance he or she may not be available and you may be meeting with a legislative aide, but I assure you that legislative aide has the ear of the Senator or the House or the House delegate that he or she serves. So they are extremely important. Don't ever talk about how bad they are while at the Capitol. So if they've passed legislation that you did not like or agree with, don't discuss it there. Again, wait until you're alone in your car and mumble and let out your frustrations there. It's a safe place to do so. Don't ever write a letter to the editor of a newspaper, a magazine, or a, a, some other type of publication saying how awful the legislator or the legislator's aide was or is. Also, don't post that type of information on social media. Now, 
When you are meeting with legislators, the golden rule of thumb is two minutes or less. So you need to convey your story within two minutes or less, or you're going to more than likely lose the concentration of that legislator. He or she has a lot on their mind. They want to hear what you have to say, but you can effectively get your message across in two minutes or less. We train how to do that through the NAMI Smarts Advocacy Training. I plan to launch a mini but powerful session of that training at the 2021 Legislative Advocacy Kickoff on November 21st. So please join for that. If you're unable to attend on November 21st this year, 2020, then I will be training more sessions in 2021. One thing that NAMI Smarts trains and that you really need to know how to do is called the elevator speech. First, in an elevator speech, it needs to be very quick and very concise. The name basically says that this has been created, this short little mini speech, concise speech, has been created if you see a legislator in the hall on an on a elevator at a water fountain and you have about 30 seconds to get your message across quickly. So the elevator speech starts with the message, what you want your legislator to know. An example of that might be, children experience mental health issues which impact their learning. Teachers need a better understanding of these impacts. So about 10 seconds in two sentences, we've delivered a powerful message. The second part of an elevator speech is your story connecting your message with your personal experience. An example would be, my 10-year-old son has anxiety issues which affect his schoolwork. It sometimes causes him to act out and his teacher is not supportive of his needs. Again, powerful, a powerful message in two quick sentences. You wanna close your elevator speech with your request or your ask. This is what you want your legislator to know and to do. So an example might be, Senate Bill 1472 would require full-time teachers to participate in mental health first aid training. I hope you will support this bill to improve the teacher's understanding of mental illness. If you combine the two sentences from section one, the two sentences from section two, as well as the two sentences from section three, in six sentences and in about 30, maybe 40 seconds, you have delivered a powerful message through an elevator speech to your legislator. NAMI Virginia provides numerous advocacy resources. We have an on-site voice at the General Assembly during the full session. Uh, I'm generally there most days. We are also there outside of session. Uh, this year, 2020, there have been two sessions. The regular session that occurred early in the year and began in January, and then the special session. So we have a voice at the General Assembly quite a bit. It's not only myself. We have numerous advocates who, who work with us there. NAMI Virginia also puts out a bill list with our positions, and this bill is updated. This bill list is updated weekly and sent out to our listserv. NAMI Virginia provides weekly legislative update emails to our newsletter distribution list and advocacy alert messages as needed when important issues come up that need immediate attention or action. NAMI Virginia provides trainings like this and like NAMI Smarts for our advocates. NAMI Virginia also provides special, event, special events like our advocacy kickoff, our, our legislative advocacy kickoff, our Advocacy Action Day. The NAMI Board of Directors also has a public policy committee. NAMI Virginia also has a Legislative Action Center 
to enable our members, advocates, and stakeholders to send targeted communications to legislators. NAMI Virginia provides up-to-date fact sheets and policy position documents on our website, and those are also provided through NAMI at the national level. So let me make one last point. Advocacy can take time. Getting what we want doesn't happen overnight, but change, even though change takes time and it's often incremental, be persistent and do not give up because it can and it does happen. If you have any questions, I would, be, you know, I would love to hear from you. And this is how I can be reached. Again, my name is Kathy Harkey. I am Executive Director of NAMI Virginia. And my phone number here at the office is 804-285-8264. And my extension is 200. Thank you so much for joining me today for Advocacy 101.